Good morning guys. So today our passage is going to be Satchel Page. Now so far this year we've been reading fictional texts and this is going to be our first really in close look at a non-fiction text. Specifically this is going to be a biography. So when we think about biography that's telling the story about a person's life. Before we start reading something we want to always do is set a purpose. So why are we reading this? It's nonfiction, so we're reading it to learn. With fiction, we might be reading it to learn a lesson. We might be reading it to be entertained by a story. We might be reading it to learn a little bit more about a cultural belief or uh, fable. But with nonfiction, we're always reading it to learn. With nonfiction, you're going to have some more complex vocabulary at times and the events may be a little bit more confusing. So the first thing we want to do when we identify that it's nonfiction and that we're reading it to learn is to slow down our reading rate. With AR books, they're in your reading range. You can typically read them at a little bit faster pace. With this, we need to slow it down so that we can really concentrate on what's going on. All right, so Satchel Page. Leroy Satchel Page earned his nickname as a young man. He carried suitcases, satchels, for passengers at Union Station in Mobile, Alabama. Satchel was a natural athlete. People said that by the age of 10, he could outpitch grown men. So in 1923, at the age of 19, he decided to earn his living as a baseball player. In those days, baseball was a segregated sport. African Americans were forced to play in their own leagues, separate from whites. As a semi-pro pitcher, Satchel developed his own unique style. He'd pick up a tip here and there, put his Satchel spin on it, and polish it off with a brand new name. Got so Satchel began to think of his pitches as his children. The hesitation was his magic slow ball. The trouble ball caused all sorts of havoc. And then there was the B ball, which according to Satch would always be where I wanted it to be. There was an odd way about his pitching. He would stand tall and straight as an oak tree on the mound. His foot looked to be about a mile long, and when he shot it into the air, it seemed to block out the sun. Satch's arms seemed to stretch on forever, winding, bending, twisting. And then there was that grin he flashed just as he released the ball. It seemed to say, go ahead, just try and get a hit off of that. Strike one, and you never saw it coming. I mean. One minute it was there, plain as day in his hand, and the next, all of a sudden, strike two. It was in the catcher's mitt. The batter would strain his eyes, squint a little. Here it comes. Got it now. Strike three. Just like that. All over. Next batter up. Give it to him, Satch. Show off your stuff fans and teammates would shout, and he did, every time. Folks would pack the stands to see how many Satchel could strike out in one game. He made the crowds laugh with his fast talking and slow walking. A man's got to go slow to go long and far, he'd say, but mostly he made them cheer. Never in his 19 years had he heard a sweeter sound. The more cheers he heard, the more his confidence grew. A kind of confidence that made him call to the outfield with the bases loaded and the last batter hitter up to bat. Why don't you all have a seat? Won't be needing you on this one. Once he reached his mid-thirties, the joys of traveling began to wear thin for Satchel. 
he found himself longing for a more settled life and the comforts of a home. In 1941, he finally found it in the warm smile and tender heart of Lahoma Brown. Satch rested his travel-weary legs and happily began his second career as husband and father. But even though he had finally found what he thought he'd been searching for, it was only a year before he took to the road again with his first and only true love, baseball. His family would have to wait. Satchel's teammates were in love with the game too, and out of that love grew players better than anyone could ever dream. His teammates included Cool Papa Bell, a hitter who ran bases so fast if you'd blinked, you'd swear he never left home plate. Oscar Charleston was an outfielder who could tell just where a ball would land as, land as soon as it hit the bat. And then, there was Josh Gibson, who some said could hit a ball so hard and so far it would land somewhere in the middle of next week. Because of his powerful hitting and home run record, Josh was sometimes called the Black Babe Ruth, but many wondered if the Babe should have been called the White Josh Gibson. Back in 1923, when Gibson and Satch were teammates on the Pittsburgh Crawfords, they were considered a mighty powerful duo. Posters for the Crawfords read, Josh Gibson and Satchel Page, the greatest battery in baseball. Gibson guaranteed to hit two home runs and Page guaranteed to strike out the first nine men. Someday we'll meet up and see who's best, they would often joke with each other. In 1942, soon after Satchel's return to the road, they got their chance. It was September 10, 1942, the second game of the Negro World Series. Satch's team, the Kansas City Monarchs, was in a heated best-of-seven matchup against the Homestead Grays, led by Josh Gibson. Toward the end of the game, Satch decided to raise the stakes. With two outs in the inning and one man on base, he walked two players so the bases would be loaded when Josh Gibson came up to bat. Someday we'll meet up and see who's best, rang in Satch's ears as he prepared to face the man who would now determine the fate of his team and Satch's reputation. Satchel called to Josh. Remember back when we were playing with the Crawfords and you said you was the best hitter in the world and I was the best pitcher? Yeah. I remember, Josh called back. Well, now we're going to see what's what, Satch said. With a ball in hand and a grin on his face, Satch told Josh, I'm going to throw a fastball, let her high. Strike one. Josh shook his head, tightened his grip on the bat, and resumed his position as he tried to stare into Satchel's eyes. But Satch stared straight ahead at Josh's knees. His coach back at the Mount Meg school had always told him, look at the knees, Satch. Every weakness a batter has, you can spot in the knees. Now I'm going to throw this one a little faster and belt high, Satch said during the windup. Strike two. In typical Satch style, he called in a mocking voice. Now I got you, 0-2, oh and, and I'm supposed to knock you down. But instead, I'm going to throw a pee at your knee. Strike three. Josh never moved the bat. Satch slowly exhaled the breath he'd been holding since the windup. It was over. He'd done what he'd come to do. Nobody hit Satchel's fastball, he said through a smile as bright as the sun, and nobody ever will. <laughs>